Hey everyone, it's me, Austin Fuller, and today we have a very special guest. We are joined by Alana Bohumal from Humily. She's the co-founder there. Uh, as always, we we have Grayson Fulbright. He's certainly not to be disregarded. Welcome, Alana. How are you doing today? Yeah, thank you, Austin. I'm really excited to be here today and chat all things emails. <laughs> yeah, really excited because today we've got two rewrites. One was written by Alana and one by Grayson. So uh, we're going to have plenty to talk about. I, for one, plan on just stepping back a little bit and watching the fireworks because this is going to be a really fun episode. Yeah, I completely agree. And I'm, I'm excited to see two separate takes um, on the, the sequence we're looking at today. And for context, for everyone joining us, um, we're going to be looking at an email, step one, and then a follow-up email, so a step two. Um, and then uh, Elena and myself both did our own kind of versions of the rewrite. And so we've got six emails we're going to be looking at today uh, during the episode. So I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Oh, gosh. It's too many. <laughs> it, is, it is quite a lot. So we'll, uh, let's jump right in. I'll go ahead and I'll read the originals. And then I think uh, we'll, we'll, and then we'll open it up for uh, Alana to... Um, discuss and have her reactions because these were actually emails that were sent to her. So I think it'll be good to get her reaction first and then we can chip in there. So I'll go ahead and share the screen here for all our viewers. And uh, all right, email number one. Hi, Alana, I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'd be interested in discussing how other computer software companies are using our solution to reduce credit card processing fees. We help companies renegotiate their credit card processing terms with their current vendor, saving them money without them having to switch providers. Our average savings range from 20 to 30%. Would you be available for a quick call on Tuesday? P.S. We only get paid on the savings that we find. No response from there. Email to RE call. I'm following up on my previous email. Is there any hesitation as to why this may not work out for you? I can send you a savings analysis with concrete figures. All I would need is your last month's processing statement. Looking forward to your response. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, as you said, um, I think when I got this email, the first thing uh, I saw it is just, it looks like really like the most like typical sales email you receive like every single day. And start uh, just to start from something like positive I think like that I like that it's not too long and it's kind of like friendly but I definitely see a couple of areas to improve it like when we talk about the context and the structure in general so first of all I think that starting with I hope you're having a wonderful day and I'm a huge fan of using like wonderful day like you know um, to send all these positive vibes to everyone but when you don't know the person, like uh, when you didn't have like any connection before, I think it's just kind of like a waste of space because you need to be concise first, like, and you have like only like a few seconds of prospect's attention to grab it. Otherwise you just, you know, you just disappear in tons of other emails that look exactly like this. So I wouldn't start it with, I hope you're having a wonderful day uh, and Another thing that caught my attention is that it's super eye focused. So starting with, I would be interested in discussing how other computer software companies are using our solution. It's just, you know, it's just very difficult, like uh, to say it like um, in the right way, but no one really cares about like our desires as salespeople. And I think our goal is to transition from what we want to say, like, how cool we are, how cool our solution is to what our prospects want to hear or are more likely to experience. So this is definitely where I would like, like to make a twist and probably switch the focus from I to you and to me like a prospect. And also I think that it follows with uh, like, like in general, the second paragraph, like the value offering, uh, it's kind of like too long from my perspective. It just, you know, if we look like, um, let's say like 46% of people like check their emails on their mobile phones. So if you try to check this email on your mobile phone, it, it can be like just too much. It will be like a bit over, uh, overwhelming. So I would like probably like cut it a little bit. Um, 
Yeah, and I think that the next thing um, is a direct call request. So probably it's just for me, but I don't really like feel the connection and feel there, you know, that the other person like put enough effort to, you know, kind of like get my time. So I think that like in general, like direct meeting requests, probably they can work like in certain, like in certain circumstances, but in general, I'm a huge fan like of using interest-based CTAs, like I open to learning more, something like that. Or another alternative is to use discovery questions. So if you treat your emails like a discovery opportunity, you're discovering, you're confirming, uh, confirming or denying the interest of your prospect. And yeah, that's definitely another area where I, I can see some improvements. And the last thing um, is PS. And this is a very interesting topic because I'm a PS girl. I like to use PS in my emails, in my LinkedIn messages. And I think for me, it's more like, you know, a casual add-on when you're like ending a conversation with person like a uh, face-to-face, you say something, oh, you know, by the way, like your daughter is so cute. Or uh, I don't know, like a great job on like jumping into the, into the tech world or something like that. It's like another opportunity to say something valuable. Uh, yeah, so I think that probably we can talk about PS a bit more like later on. Yeah, I think so. You made a lot of good points, and and you know what, you saying PS like that, I think, I think a lot of times there's a lot of good research we do on prospects that isn't really relevant, like their favorite sports team or where they went to college, or you know similarities you can find. And PS is actually a pretty good place where you can toss the things that don't really apply directly to moving the email forward. I think that's a good way to use it. I think. Really quick, I'm going to jump, I'm going to scroll down to the color code if that's all right with Grayson. Is that all right? Is this, do you, we can jump down. Um, Grayson, what are, what are your thoughts? I think Elena made a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of really good points. And, you know, we see that a lot on the show is that there's a lot of me or, you know, what we call orange, right? That's our, the orange's brand slash seller information, the seller talking about themselves. Um, and she made a lot of good points there. Yeah, no, I agree with all of them. And uh, I, I kind of wanted to start in the middle because I do think where out of everything that that sort of is where the email falls apart. And this is something that people often do in sales emails. So they'll basically reach out and say, I'm reaching out about and would like to chat or would like to learn more or I'm curious about X, Y, Z. And then they'll have their pitch and say, brand name does this. We help do this. We help companies like yours do X, Y, Z, benefit this, benefit that. Um, But when you're doing that, the whole point is you're trying to get from someone who's a stranger to someone who seems to know what they're doing in the industry to someone that generates curiosity and might be worth a conversation. And, and, and those steps, it doesn't happen automatically just by sending an email. You can't just say, hey, I want to talk about this with you. And here is why. Here's what we do. When are you good on Friday? Right? It, it almost excludes the prospect from the conversation. It's like you're talking to yourself. And when you're trying to talk about your product, talk about the problems that you're trying to solve for the, uh, for the prospect, you need to make sure that you're explaining it in a way that makes sense in their world. And so when you say I'd be interesting, interested in discussing how other computer software companies, just that line in itself, you can tell that it's a little vague and that they're not being clear on exactly what the discussion is about, where the value is coming from. And it leaves a lot of like confusion. And we talk about this on the show where when a prospect is confused or a little suspicious of what's going on in an email, that's usually a bad sign. And they'll usually not spend more time reading it. And so you need to put forth something that shows them, I've talked to people in your industry before, I know what's going on, and I somewhat know what your company is about. So you could take this entire kind of middle section right here, maybe trim it down, be a little bit more, like uh, Elena said, like, you focused rather than just talking about me, me, me. And I think that the email would greatly improve. Um, I think we can get into uh, get into the PS soon, but I also wanted to, to note the, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Um, I completely agree with Elena here that 
you have limited space and limited time to try to get somebody to spot your email among a bunch and decide that they want to put that time forward and read it. So with that limited space, you want to stick out. You want to be unique. You want to catch attention and quote, be a disruptor. And you can't do that with a generic sentence like this. Like, yes, it might be like well intended. It might have some warmth to it, but that is not what gets you meetings and that's not what gets you sales. And in, in, in the cold email and the cold prospecting world, you have to take the limited time that you have to go from complete stranger that's untrusted to somebody that drives enough curiosity to at least get some next steps out of it. And so don't waste that space on something that is, is generic that they can't use to differentiate your email from another uh, person's email. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you on that. It's like, it's not an easy job, like, you know, to do this transition from the stranger to person, like, you know, that you can like trust, but yeah, I think this is the only way, like, you know, to experiment with your messages and like try to find what works for you and in the most concise ways for sure. So talking about the follow-up email, we talked a lot about the initial one. I'm going to try and keep us moving on a good pace here so we can get to the four rewrites we have. Uh, you know, I don't think, so the first email is really cordial. And for me, it jumps to very, very, uh, I want to say curt, but it's very short to the point. All right, hey, I didn't get you on the first one. Here's, guess what? I'll do a savings analysis. Just send me your last month's statement. Right now, now you're getting... Uh, uh, you're getting a little quick to the trigger, as I would say. The first one was quick to the trigger, right? Like uh, uh, Alana said, um, you know, hey, I, they're asking for the meeting a little too early. And now they're just now they're just pulling out of the stops. I'll show you how much you can save. Just send me your statement. L looking forward to your response. Let's do it. You know what I mean? It's just like um, it's the old school kind of telemarketing stuff. Um, you know, I can just I can hear it over the phone, if somebody called me and pitched me with this, like I can hear exactly how it would sound. And so anyway, that's my read on the, the second one is the, the jump seemed for just for a second email. And, you know, I do know this industry. Well, I don't know it personally, but I do have a buddy that it's in merchant processing. And he says, it's a very cutthroat world. Like everyone's trying to cut undercut everyone, two, three, 4%, right? Cause it's a game. People don't want to pay. It's the fee you pay every time you swipe a card uh, uh, to process a payment. So there's a lot of battling on price in the industry. So that's kind of some context around why they would send a message like this. I just feel like there's nothing. They went from zero to like super desperate end of the sequence email on their second email. That's my impression. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Austin. And one thing that probably we did not uncover about the first one is when in PS section, we see we only get paid on the savings that we find. And then in follow-up, we see I can send you a savings analysis. So it's, from my perspective, it's, as you said, it's just a little bit too desperate, I think, at this stage. So yeah, it just like, I don't know. It, I think like using this like very direct and pushy approach, you, you, don't, you, you do need to understand the risks because for many people, it won't resonate and people will, will be just turned off. Yeah, I completely agree. I think kind of going into the follow-up email, I, we, we talk about like social capital and, and I, I think it, it's worth noting that just because you are a salesperson or just because you are in a position that is responsible for business development, that doesn't give you the right or the the privilege to talk to another professional that professional has their own schedule their own workload they've got their own people to manage and they get to do what they want with their time and what you don't want to do as a seller is get in the position to where you're almost coming off as kind of like manipulating or guilt tripping somebody into trying to respond to you um it's it's kind of like uh, it, it's it's kind of like dating like trying to say to somebody like hey like why won't you go out on a date with me? I, I want to know why you won't go on a date with me. Well, it's like, it, it's not their responsibility or, or they don't have to like explain that to you. It's your job to figure out what's wrong with you and why you weren't relevant or why you aren't providing good experiences and learn to improve from that. And it's the same thing in sales. I think we get this kind of privileged mindset about us that, oh, we have to do this all the time and it's all about the numbers. And so we might get few conversions, but that's all that matters. And then they take that mindset 
and they just don't treat people the way that they need to be treated. Like it's an actual business relationship. It's all just about getting through to a call. Are you interested? No. Okay. Bye. Or are you interested? No. Why? You won't tell me. Okay. Bye. It's very uh, almost like you said, Austin, it's like salespeople can almost be a little bit cutthroat about how they deal with conversations and with relationships that they build with prospects. And I think this follow-up is a good example of, of what not to do. You, you don't want to put yourself in a position to where you're guilt tripping or pressuring or trying to, to, to use social capital in a weird way. You want, to, you want it to build, you want it to help you get the meeting and then help your social capital go from meeting to eventually a closed deal. What you don't wanna do is make it this weird thing about, oh, I'm, I'm gonna give you my time because I feel sorry for you. So I think, I, I mean, I think that's a really good point to make before we transition. I think, I believe Alana's rewrites are first. I could be wrong. Let's take a peek. Yes. Okay. So, so let's move on to those. Cause I think we've, we, we've hit on some major points as to why those emails are kind of, why there's a breakdown, right? Why it doesn't actually, when viewed from the lens of a recipient that doesn't encourage them to take action or to, or to respond to you or engage with you at all. You know I mean? I, I think a lot of salespeople do jump the gun and they are in a process or a system where they're just basically sent out to gather any low hanging fruit of anyone available in the market right now, as fast as possible. And, you know, Grayson talks about this a lot, how it actually injures your brand. So we'll move over to Alana's rewrites where we're going to show you how to do it a little better that will, or probably a lot better and where it won't damage your personal brand and the brand of the company so much. Do you want to walk? Do you want to walk through your uh, uh, rewrites, Alana? You want to just read them first, and then uh, we can we can talk some more about them. Yeah, yeah. I, so yeah, I can read them. So the the first uh, email will be like, "Hi, Alana. Talking to other founders. It looks like lowering credit card processing fees is one of their current priorities. What's your experience with this after six months on the market? Using a brand, you can save twenty to thirty percent on every transaction without leaving your current vendor. Are you open to learning more?" Uh, yeah, Austin. So would you like me to go first? Um, uh, yeah, we can. So uh, if you want, uh, yeah. Uh, would you like me to read the second one? I can read the second one. Then we can talk yeah, about them. Yeah, yeah, you can read the second one. Hi, Alana. Negotiating lower card processing fees is a real pain, is what other founders keep saying. Do you see this as one of your key priorities? We help companies like your company renegotiate their credit card processing terms with their current vendor. As a result, they manage to save 20 to 30% without switching to another provider. Great. So I, so I'll, I'll start off with, with my reaction here. The first thing is, is that you have, so you talked about it a lot above the first parts of your emails are very discovery oriented, which I think is great because it helps get a conversation started. And a lot of times I think that as salespeople, we try too much to just get a meeting reply, like, yes, let's meet. And we don't actually try to talk to prospects first and engage and understand who they are and where they come from. Yeah, I, I think that was one of the points like, you know, of like trying to keep aside all this like sales part of the email and focus on like confirming or denying like, uh, yeah, the interest, the timing and like, you know, just trying to start a conversation in a really smooth way. Um, also, I think that one of their, um, yeah, one of the ideas was to include like this little like, uh, just part of the sentence after six months is on the market. And I can see that this is like a super personalization, but at the same time, it gives some pretty good idea that at least you did your research and you know that this company is early on the market um, rather than, you know, just like send something super generic. Yeah, I, what I really like about your emails is that you're, you're putting the topic you wanna talk about at the, at the front of your email, but you're framing it in a way that's valuable. It's, it's not, it's not a, a, Alina saying, hi, I want to talk to you about, you know, credit card processing fees. You're saying, hey, I, I have insights or, or, or conversations from other founders and here's what they're saying. And, and that's the, right. That's so much more valuable. And that would even, even somebody who's not in market or maybe not interested, they might still say, oh, wow, interesting. Like, let me know more. I'm curious. I'd like to hear more. So I really like the way that you, you lead 
with the, the value and the, and the lesson that you want your prospect to kind of take away. And then the way that you, you write your emails, it's very, it's very succinct, concise, uh, or direct. I can't find the right word, um, but, it, but it's written very tight. So it's that you, you frame it and you get to the point and say, hey, this is what I'm about. What do you think? Um, and my last note would be, I, I love your questions, your CTAs. Um, I am always trying to improve ways to have like open-ended questions. Um, and I've, I haven't actually haven't used this second one, the do you see this as a key priority? Um, but I think I might try. I think I might add that to one of my tests. I like it. Yeah, the funny thing is that I usually like preach uh, about using like um, open-ended questions instead of a closed-ended one. Uh, but yeah. We will just get to the second email and I decided to experiment it with something like new, you know. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, sh should we continue with the second one? Yeah, jump in. I, I read the second one. What's uh, so I see. So one of the things that you did in the second one that I noticed was that you've got that first line and then you have a question and then you have, you know, the value following that question. What are some of the, you know, what are some of the reasons that, that you did that? I mean, for me, like Grayson said, I, so Grayson does something very similar. He's very similar in style of like the first email where he likes to lead with the value and then CTA. He really, he's good at framing up his CTAs. Um, and, and so I find this formula down on your second email really interesting. If you want to tell us more about it. Yeah, I think that uh, the second email is just, I, I tried to put like my insert, the statement in, in front. Uh, so and the second question, like it's a closed ended one, but it helps me to understand whether it really aligns with them or not. And even if um, this is this problem, this challenge um, doesn't really align with my prospect, he will he will reply like no to me or just, you know, uh, and it will start another conversation. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, like, unless he um, I, he will reply something like, never contact me again. Uh, but anyway, like, I think the idea is just like to do this like discovery. Um, yeah, yeah, just to do discovery and confirm or deny it. And then like give um, a little, just, just a slight idea of what exactly uh, we try to accomplish with our solution. And in this case, uh, the key point is that we're trying to negotiate like the terms of firm, um, the credit card process and fees. So just wanted like, you know, to highlight it then, uh, highlighted this, but I didn't like include any other CTAs on purpose because I think it's enough just to see whether it's of interest to my prospect or not. Yeah, I agree. And then the, other, I mean, the other thing is that you include the CTA and then include another, you know, more value and reason for why you would act on it. There's no reason for us another one. Yeah. Um, and the first part is really good social proof, right? If you're a founder and maybe if you don't know what a pain, so first off, if you're a founder and you haven't negotiated credit card processing fees before, maybe that's a new insight for you. Like, oh, I could be negotiating those lower because for a founder, it's important because that's just a percentage they're taking out of your credit card transactions. So, I mean, that's money back in your pocket. So, you know, the, the, your, your insight in the first line is a great, is a great line, I think is a great piece of social capital for people in a variety of situations. You have your, you have a nice exploratory call to action and followed up with, you know, value to cement why you would take action on it. So I think that works really well. Yeah. Thank you, Austin. All right. Do you want to, uh, do we want to transition to Grayson's rewrites here? Yeah, let's do I this. I think it's a good, uh, a good point to do that. Um, Grayson, I've talked a lot. You want to, you want to read the first one? Yeah, sure. Um, so email number one. Uh, hi, Elena. Uh, I checked out the company pricing page today to learn more about your software and was curious what payment methods you currently offer to new customers. I advise a lot of SaaS founders that share a common challenge. Modern consumers demand payment options be flexible and convenient, which can become an obstacle to both conversions and profitability. Has the company had any similar experiences? If so, I'd love to share some of the best practices I've given to other software startups to help minimize avoidable expenses and improve purchase experiences. If not, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this topic. I host a monthly Zoom roundtable for software founders and have heard a lot of interesting takes so far. Uh, email two goes, hi, Elena. Uh, are you open to learning about new best practices and trends in the software space? 
Uh, I regularly talk with SaaS founders about pricing and profitability and then share the insights I gather from my conversations in a monthly Zoom roundtable. If you'd be interested in participating or listening in, I can send over an invite to the next one. Alternatively, I'd be happy to share a video of last month's event if you'd like to check it out. Uh, would you be open to learning more? Yeah, I really like both of these emails. And I think, you know, uh, you, you dived into more details and like, you know, uh, added a specific insight about like what challenges you're trying like to um, help other founders to overcome. And I think that, yeah, I mean, like, I, I really like also that you started like by being curious, like what methods you currently offer to new customers. So you don't like jump straight into the pitch. You started with like kind of discovery or exploration. Then you mentioned like insight and then you are like double checking whether it's something they experience right now. So this part is kind of like, I think similar to my rewrites in some way. Uh, and what I really like um, about the first email is that you're leading with the value. So you're open like to share like, you know, uh, you're open like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm confused. I was looking at the second one and I wanted to say that I really like this idea like to share the video that you did, like give them some insight that you learned. And yeah, it's just much better than like asking for a call right away for me. So I think like, you know, you, you, you just, you just added more context, like comparing to my examples and that's what I really like. So it, it looks more smooth, like, and, you know, um, more filled with like insights for another person. Yeah. And my goal with this one, um, was to try to show that like, there are so many areas inside of an email or inside of a message where you can add value. Or, or, or show the prospect that you have been in this industry, you know what's going on in the industry. Um, and that, that was my mission with these two is I was trying to say, okay, credit card processing, that's a really tough industry. What are some ways that we can get through that? Well, let's try to position ourselves as somebody influential who can maybe even help give advice and tips to the people that you're selling to. Yeah. And I think, I think that you did this pretty well, specifically in the second one, when you like inviting them like to participate in one of your, like um, in for one of your sessions. So it's a really, I think it's a really smart move and it really helps like to build this credibility, which we usually like kind of underestimate and like try to include some direct call to actions like, and yeah, just, you know, win the prospect's time uh, too early. So yeah, I think like um, just getting back uh, probably for, if we have like a couple more minutes, maybe we can jump into the PS topic just really quickly. Sure. Yeah, we can get on it. So to, to frame it for everyone watching, um, I have heard controversy around the use of PS. And I think that um, uh, Elena and myself have different views. What I'll say is that I tend not to use PSs. And when I do use PSs, I don't use it for personalization. I tend to use it for nurture or trying to offer an alternative next step from whatever call to action I'm using. What, what do you think, Lena? Yeah, as I said, I, I love using PS like, and, but at the same time, I don't think that's something that, you know, that we should dictate to everyone. So it's just, it should align with your email writing style in general. So if you write like a really short conversational emails and you have like, you know, um, you have this similarity. Um, if you remember, I made this example from a real life when you're just saying something uh, in the end of conversation, oh, hey, like congrats on this or great job on that, on this thing. So you can end your emails with PS. I think that one of the best things about PS in general is that you don't necessarily need this, um, you don't necessarily need to align this with your email. As Austin said, it can be just a piece of personalization or it can be like uh, some relevant content as you mentioned, Grayson, like add something like more educational so you can nurture your prospect. Uh, and in the case um, like of our emails, let's say we can add like PS, can we just um, like get back to, to my room rights for a second? Yeah, so let's say um, 
we, we can add like for the first email, we can add like PS uh, thought you may find this guide on negotiating uh, card process and fees useful for you and just a link. So yeah, there are a lot of ways you can do this and uh, to use this piece. It's just another extra opportunity, like a very useful add on to your email. So yeah, if you feel comfortable doing this, if it aligns with your style, why not to do that? If it doesn't feel like something that comes naturally to you, I think you shouldn't just do this. You, you, you can do like pretty good, like, like you did, uh, Grayson, without it. Uh, you mentioned, I don't really remember like uh, the phrasing, but you said something, if this is like, or if you have similar experience, uh, like you may find this valuable. So you can avoid PS in general. I'd be interested in running an experiment with PS and not PS. I don't know. I've never, I've never been big on using it, not because I don't like it, but just because, like you said, it's not really in my style. I think if you, you know, I think it's really good to to write the way you speak, and you know, if you use it, if you kind of are that, you know, if you have a nice, happy disposition and cheerful personality, and you know, you can put it in there, then great. The problem is, I'm a real grouch, so it doesn't really work that well for me. <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's all about, like, it gives you the chance to break the fourth wall, um, but it can be distracting. Um, I do know we're about a minute past, but um, thank you, Elena, so much for joining us today. And for everyone who has joined us today, thank you. Um, we will have this video up on YouTube as well uh, later this week so that you can check it out if you missed it. Um, and join us next week. We'll be doing this every Monday, 11.30 a.m. Eastern. And uh, feel free to, to send us some emails that you'd like us to rewrite or come join us uh, for, for the show. Yeah, thank you guys for inviting me. It was like my pleasure to join you and chat about this. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.